70% of millennials say they are likely to vote for a socialist, according to a recent survey. And even putting aside the term socialism, which is not clear many people really understand, it's clear that many people today believe that the government should have a larger role in society and in people's lives. And the individual, well, we're told that the individual must be subordinate to some group, to the collective, to the state. Political figures like Bernie Sanders and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez have built a significant following, and they're drawing a new generation to what they call democratic socialism. Socialism or capitalism, which is the moral system? Today, the Ayn Rand Institute is hosting a YouTube premiere event for a classic, indeed a legendary debate on precisely that question, which is the moral system, socialism or capitalism? In about 30 minutes, you'll be able to watch a remastered video of that debate from 1984. And to watch that debate is to be riveted. It is a charged debate over timeless moral issues. Speaking for capitalism are two objectivist intellectuals, Leonard Peikoff and John Ridpath. For the socialists, Jerry Kaplan and Jill Vickers. We at ARI are thrilled to bring this video to new generations who can benefit from engaging with the objectivist moral case for capitalism that Ayn Rand first articulated and that you can hear in this debate. As we count down to the premiere, I'm joined by Sandra Shaw, a noted sculptor who was the driving force behind that debate. And we're gonna talk about how the event came about and what the experience was like. I'd like to welcome Sandra onto the stage. Hi, Sandra. Hello. Hi, it's great to have you. Great to see you. I wanted to start by first speaking on behalf of the Institute to thank you for giving us permission to host this video on YouTube. Oh, you're welcome. And, and I, I wanted to explain a little how we're, why we're thinking of this as a premiere event, because for many years, this video was available to people on VHS, if people remember that format. And I, I, there might have been a DVD, I don't know. Um, but since YouTube has exploded, there have been a number of bootleg versions, which people have watched numerous times. We're premiering the definitive version, which has been remastered thanks to you. And it's pre the premiere of the first legal version, which I think is really important because it yes, goes to the first part uh, of the pirated version. Yes, exactly. And it goes to a core issue, which is that we respect property rights and particularly in intellectual property rights. So we really wanted to get your uh, approval and, and we're grateful for that as yeah. the person who uh, initiated this. So Sandra, I wanted to start by talking a bit about just the impact of this debate. And I happen to be talking to someone who I'm pretty sure that this person is young. <laughs> I didn't ask specifically about younger than I am, a millennial probably. And he was telling me that he's watched this debate a lot of times and it was really formative in thinking about these issues. So I, and I think it's, it's, it's because it's not really about what was going on in Canada in 1984 when the event was happening. It's, it's really going to universal fundamental issues. So I wanted to ask you a bit about what inspired you personally to invest all this time and thought in, in putting on such a, such a massive event. Well, the inspiration was um, my own journey, really, to understand capitalism to, and more deeply to understand morality. And I was really struggling at the time. I mean, I, I was a socialist. Um, that might surprise you, but um, uh, I was a socialist, at least in terms of thinking of myself that way. And I, uh, I had a big job that took me years to sort out whether or not socialism is, is true. And uh, when I encountered objectivism, it was, that was a big deal for me. And I needed to know if that was true. So um, part of uh, why I did this was just personal. I, I, I needed to see a debate like this. I needed to see socialism set against objectivism, uh, not conservatism, but objectivism. And that kind of debate really wasn't going on uh, at the university. And um, I should say at the universities, 
uh, plural. I mean, I, I, I transferred from York to U of T and the situation was the same. Um, and uh, it was frustrating. And I thought, well, gee, this is a really important issue. This is a life or death issue. Everybody ought to know about this uh, one way or another, either side, they're, one side's right, the other's wrong, or, or perhaps they're both wrong, but you know, this needs to be out in the public eye. So that's why I thought of doing the debate on the scale that I did. I, it, I just want to offer some context for people who are watching who were not alive in 1984, were too young to appreciate the, just, the, just uh, the climate intellectually. So I think this yeah. was true in Canada. It's definitely true across Western Europe and the United States that socialism was a live issue in the universities, but in the sense that it was just the norm. This was the only view that was seen as reputable and respectable, that there weren't really advocates for capitalism in the universities who are prominent and effectual. And I think that part of what I was so impressed by in this event was you brought in um, Leonard Peikoff and John Ridpath to speak on a university campus and really bring that perspective where it was just, it was not anywhere available uh, right. for people. That's exactly right. Uh, that was one, I mean, it was a totally unique uh, experience for everybody. And this is at the time when, so the Berlin Wall is still up. The Soviet Union is still widely seen as a, a noble experiment. And on the world stage, this, this conflict of socialism versus capitalism, it wasn't, I don't think, one of the criticisms Ayn Rand made for many years was it wasn't really honestly engaged with, but it was, it was there in front of people the whole time. And, and I think part of the, the power and part of what makes this event so electric is that you, you kind of structured it to go to what's really important. So I wanted to ask you a bit about that because I, I noticed um, you didn't leave this in the hands of the moderator. You had a particular vision for what the, well, the event would be script. about. He was very nice about that. I, I, uh, I mm. wanted a uh, theme. I wanted uh, uh, the connection, of course, to Orwell's 84 and what that uh, uh, suggests about our future. Um, and I wanted it to be a debate about ideas, um, about morality. Um, and so that was ex explicit. And I also used that in, in uh, my ads. Um, um, so uh, by the time everyone was seated and listening to Peter Deborah's opening, the terms were set. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's what's interesting is that we where you see this kind of con conversation about capitalism today versus what people think of as socialism or the mixed economy or the welfare state kind of approach, which is the norm around the world, or the, sort of the, the, the default model for many people, it often gets sort of bogged down in questions about the statistics. So if you think about, if you zoom back to 1984, there was well, are the Soviets going to produce more than, than the free market? Are they able to create more? It, well, is the system, can they actually have, um, are their factories more efficient because they're using a different model where there's collective ownership? And, and the, the debate is not about those kinds of things. It really gets to what I think of as something that we, we people haven't really grappled with enough, which is the question, is this right? Is this good? Yes, and, and you can see in the debate how the two sides are treating that, uh, su their subject uh, differently, very differently. Uh, the objectivists were presenting a case at, for morality as, as, the, as the base, and the socialists were presuming a morality and uh, that's, that's part of what you, you're addressing, that it was really a presumption at the time. Uh, I, I would argue that it's still a presumption, uh, but it, it certainly was dramatized uh, in the debate that that is a presumption uh, of the left and uh, perhaps the culture at large of what morality consists of um, and, uh, and how to forward the morality by means of the emotions.
So yeah. yeah, as people will see when we go, when the premiere happens in uh, just under 20 minutes, uh, I think one of the first uh, points that Leonard Peikoff makes in his opening remarks is that we need to rethink how we view these issues, the, these moral issues, and, and he starts unfolding uh, a very, I think, incisive summary of Rand's perspective on morality. Yes, um, I, I, the opening remarks on the capitalist side were so succinct, I felt like, well, that the debate's over. <laughs> it was, I mean, they really uh, got to the heart of it. Um, and it was tragic in, in, in a sense that the socialists couldn't respond to that at that level. Um, I had tried to get different socialists. I, I had aimed for, for Stephen Lewis, but I don't know if, if he could have handled it either. Um, so tell us a bit about who, who, who was Stephen Lewis that you had hoped to get, and then maybe we can talk a bit about who the, the two participants were well, on the socialist side. Steve, Stephen Lewis was a central figure in the socialist movement in Canada. He and his father, David, uh, they had, um, you know, I mean, they had created a, a culture of debate. Uh, I mean, they were debaters. And uh, he was, uh, Stephen Lewis was very erudite. Um, he was a politician, ended up in broadcasting. So he, uh, he would have been perfect uh, for this. Uh, I, I, I had a lot of respect for him and would have loved to have seen him uh, take on the objectivists. And I, 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 so we have an article in our uh, publication, New Ideal, that talks a bit about the backstory. And uh, for people who want to hear more about it, I will I recommend that they take a look at this article. I'm going to show it on the screen. Uh, I, I helped shape the headline for this because I wanted to be very provocative. If you can see it on, this, on the slide, it's capitalists demolish socialists in debate on systems morality. But that's not how I would introduce this to most very people. Bold. I want, yes, I wanted it to present, to present something really provocative. But I, I mean, my takeaway from the event really is I don't think the socialists did well for their part. Um, and, you know, one thing I'd like to just get a sense of for people who are going to watch this for the first time in a, in a little while is, so uh, uh, Jerry Kaplan and Jill Vickers, so they seem like they're really accomplished people. So just can you give us like a thumbnail for each one of them? Who are they? And what, how, what, how did they get on your radar? Uh, well, I had not, I don't think I'd heard of Jerry. Jerry Kaplan. I might have come across his name prior to the prior to this project, uh, but I certainly had not heard of uh, Jill Vickers. Um, uh, I did go after S Stephen Lewis, and he recommended Kaplan, so that's why I, I mm -hmm. went for him. And then uh, I he, uh, he invited his 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 uh, debating partner, so she was his choice. So that was a bit of a, a wild card. Uh, I didn't know really what to expect. Um, I um, prepped the socialists by giving Kaplan a huge amount of information about their opponents and about objectivism. And I even told him what their arguments were going to be <laughs> at the time. <laughs> I, I actually weighted the debate in favor of the socialists uh, in that sense. Um, uh, but uh, from what I saw on stage, I, I don't think they took what I said seriously at all. So. And I, I want to talk a bit about, um, so you, what I'm, you know, you've raised how this was part of your intellectual journey and, and you needed to see this kind of issue dealt with in this way. And I think that it really de definitely succeeds in, in doing that as, as an event. I wanna ask you a bit about, so you were a student at the time and I, I've been in, involved in putting on events much smaller than this. And I can tell you, it's just, it's overwhelming. So I, I'm looking yeah, at this yeah. event <laughs> yeah, it's and nuts. here you, and, and your, um, so tell us a bit about what it's like being a college student trying to put on a, 
an epic scale event. And with a part-time job. Yeah. Okay, there. Yeah. Well, I, I was living at home with my mom. Uh, that helped. Um, uh, <laughs> um, kind of a dumb aspect of this was I put my mom's phone number on all of the billboard and all the ads that went in the Toronto Star and uh, uh, I, cause I, I, and I thought that would work. Um, so that, that became a, com a completely wild situation with, uh, my mother, uh, my sister and I doing relays to the telephone. Um, but at, at any rate, um, yeah, what was it like? I, um, I think the thing that just determined the whole business was one when, when I got Convocation Hall, which holds over 1,700 people. And from that point on, I, I became a maniac about filling all the seats. I, I was not going to allow that event to take place and have half the seats filled. So I just became like an animal for about six months, doing everything I could to, to fill those seats. I almost didn't care who showed up just as long as there were people <laughs> there. And so that, uh, that motivated me big time to go all out um, uh, in terms of ads. Toronto Star was uh, still is a major uh, paper. It's kind of uh, middle of the road. It, it's not like the Sun, which was more right wing, and it's uh, yeah. So, so that you know had a big readership, uh, and then the billboard I put that at the uh, at a key intersection where a lot of people have to stop at a light to feed on to Lakeshore Boulevard, and and literally mm -hmm. every day thousands of people are stuck at this intersection feeding on to to Lakeshore to get out of the city. And so it was like the perfect place where everyone will have to just sit there and look at my billboard. So, uh, I, I put the billboard up on the screen just a moment ago because I often encounter people and they say, well, why don't you guys just put up a billboard and tell, and it's not a trivial thing to put up a billboard and it's very expensive and it's time expensive. consuming. Yeah, the, the, uh, the newspaper ads were the most expensive. I think mm -hmm. just the star ones uh, came to five about five thousand, and that's <laughs> and, and then I also at, um, advertised in the York University U of T campus papers. I think also Queens, maybe Western. I don't remember, but um, and just repeatedly, like week after week, mm -hmm. um, and of course I had the, the billboard up for a month. And I, part of what I wanted to uh, ask you about is, so to these days, if, if students want to put on an event on campus, they, one of the things they can do is they can go to the student association and get some money or they can raise money themselves, but there's often um, a benefit they can get from support from the university. And what, but in this case, this was all out of your pocket, really. Well, and I, did, this was, I did get $200 from the university. Okay. So it wasn't all, it, it, and, and I put my own money up, but I, mm -hmm. I, I solicited for donations as well as ticket mm -hmm. sales. So That's I awesome. I, you broke even, but I was going to ask about that because it's- But I me, sweated these... for a while because there was a <laughs> while there where, you know, I was in the hole and I just didn't know um, if, mm -hmm. you know, I was going to fill those seats. Um, so I, I just want to, I want to cut in here because we had a snowstorm that night. It was dreadful. I was going to raise that. So I, I wanted to, to emphasize something about the, the whole experience. And we have a lot of people watching and engaging with us on, on YouTube. Thank you all for your support. We appreciate it. And thank you. I think there's a lot of cheering for you, for what you're doing, Sandra. I, I wanted to get to that because when I've been involved in, in running events or, or putting them on. One of the things we think about is the schedule. When is it going to happen? We don't want to conflict with Mother's Day. No one's going to come on Mother's Day. And, and, you, know, it, and you want to make sure the weather is going to be on your side. So one of the things I, I remember reading about in this is not only did you do this entrepreneurially on your, largely on your own uh, dime and time, 
there was a snowstorm. Now, obviously, Canadians are much better able to deal with a snowstorm than Californians are with rain. But, you know, if I woke up that day, having put in all this time to put on this event, and there's tell this was tell you, you, you had this video recorded, and there's a massive auditorium to fill, and there's snow. Uh, my heart would sink because to me, that would be a lot of people I can imagine saying, yeah, it's snowing, let's just hang out at home. But actually what oh, yeah. happened- Yeah, and I made the tickets cheap enough that that was very feasible, that a lot mm -hmm. of people would just look at the weather and say, nah. But as you said, you actually had this, this is actually what it looked like in the hall. I'm going to show a, a clip from, so this is- Yes, and, and they hall. were, I was told that there were people standing at the back, so they, um, there were, I think there were more people there than there were seats. And then I was told that, that uh, a couple of hundred people had to be turned away. So it was a huge turnout. Yeah. But I, I, yeah. this is a, a bit of an anecdote. When I first met Peter Deverai, um, um, you know, he wanted to, to find out a little more about this, to meet me and, and uh, look at the script and whatnot. And um, I, I must have met him either in the spring or the summer. I'm, I'm not sure, but the, the weather was great when I met him. And uh, the meeting went well. And uh, you know, when it was over, we shook hands and he turned to the door and he just kind of threw over his shoulder well, let's hope for no snow. And up until that point, I, I literally hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my God, I've, I've scheduled this huge event in January and we could end up with a bloody snowstorm. And so as the snow was getting more aggressive on, on the day of, and I was driving around doing you know, final errands, all I could hear was Peter Debray saying to me, well, let's hope for no snow. <laughs> so it was a bit of a nightmare scenario. But at that point, you just have to keep going. Yeah. I, I wanted to bring in a few more uh, elements of the story before we start winding down and, and getting ready to move into the premiere itself. I, I, it, I read in the story it, that appeared in New Ideal, the one I showed earlier about the, so how you put this on. I, I was really taken by the fact that it, part of your conception for the event and its importance and significance was you, you, you had the speakers arrive in in limousines. And I think that was yes. just an aesthetic choice to just flesh out yeah. what, what you were thinking there. Well, I thought the limos would dramatize uh, in a way um, how important this is. You know, people use limos for very special occasions and to um, bring in important people, VIPs. And I wanted the speakers to be treated as VIPs. I wanted the public to see that. Whether or not they saw it through the snow, I don't know, but uh, uh, it, that was, uh, you know, that was just uh, an element uh, of the experience. I mean, I, mm -hmm. if it's a life or death issue, mm -hmm. this is important. Mm -hmm. And the people arguing one way or the other are important people. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking what people, as you put it, limos are one way in which people travel to important events, whether funerals or weddings or, or ceremonies. And I think this is a really significant confrontation on um, really important issues. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I wanted to know about, which is so, actually two more things, but let me start with this one. When, when we hear today about the climate on college campuses, you know, I hear all kinds of things and I've, I've experienced all kinds of things. I'm curious, since I think a lot of the audience that you attracted were students, and this was held on a university campus, University of Toronto, was there, did you anticipate, was there actually any pushback? Were there protests? What, what kind of reaction was there outside the auditorium? Right, I, I, I was uh, really concerned about that. So I, I had um, uh, extra campus police, uh, and I also had bouncers 
uh, indoors. Um, mm -hmm. Happily, nothing happened uh, inside. There was, uh, you know, there was, uh, I mean, there, there was a, a whole spectrum of people in the audience um, from just general public to active communists. Um, I mean, I went to everybody to, to, uh, mm -hmm. to get people in the audience. So there was uh, certainly some heckling um, uh, against what the uh, capitalists were saying. Uh, I heard that uh, a group of students showed up outside earlier and were yelling, but there was no physical violence. So that's a relief. I, I think yeah. that in, on today's campus, you'd be dealing with a more violent situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that definitely. And, and even within the old, I've been to events where uh, protesters infiltrate the event and they either, they have all kinds of tactics where they occupy seats and then leave so that people who want to attend can't attend because the seats are, oh, there. Well. and then there's also a protest thing. So I'm glad none of that happened. And in fact, as people will see when they watch the video in a few minutes, uh, the, the two things about this, or I'll just focus it on this. When the video, as you watch the video, part of what I picked up, and I, I want to hear how it was in person, the video really brings out that it was, a, the air was electric, like there was a real oh, yeah. atmosphere yeah. you could feel. And if that's what it was like in the video, which tends to attenuate those sorts of things, what was it really like in the, in the room? I would just, if you could it sketch like it out that for that us. It was like that in the room. I mean, it was extraordinary uh, when the speakers uh, were, presenting their cases. I mean, imagine over 1,700 people, you could hear a pin drop. They were absolutely riveted. I think part of that was because there were, there were people in the audience who wanted to hear what Leonard Peikoff had to say. Uh, there, were, there were people in the audience who wanted to hear what John Ridpath had to say because he was a very popular uh, teacher. There was a, an even larger uh, group of people off the street who'd never heard these arguments before. And I think it was such a startling uh, experience. And, and they, they could see the seriousness of it. They could, they could see, uh, they were witness to both sides becoming emotionally uh, engaged with with their own arguments and what was being put forward to oppose them. Um, it was a you know a passionate situation and rightfully so. And the audience was absolutely riveted. We're almost at time. And I just wanted to acknowledge one thing about the event. And I think tell me if this was how you experienced it. I would imagine most of the people coming had had heard zero or uh, misinformation about capitalism and either leaning towards socialism or active, as you mentioned, some of them were actively communists. And my impression is that this, the debate actually had a winner and it was the, the capitalist team. I mean, is that how you experienced it? I mean, or is it? In a way, um, I, I mean, I, I went into the debate as, assuming that the audience would be primarily uh, for the socialists is because the socialists were presenting a fairly conventional morality and the capitalists were not. Um, and you, uh, there, now, as I say, there was a, a, a number of people there to hear Leonard and John, and you can hear in their applause that, that they're there. Uh, but in general, uh, audience wide, it was pretty much a 50, 50 split at the mm -hmm. outset. But uh, particularly when the socialists turned on the audience and, and they turned on the audience because they were uh, you know, upset about the, the response to uh, Hakeoff and, and Ridpath, but they turned on the audience. And once they did that, then the audience uh, shifted. Um, and then as things got rolling, uh, mm -hmm. you ended up with you know, a lot of people very positive about what the capitalists had to say. And, and even the communists didn't like what the socialists were saying. I, I, uh, I thought that was a bit amusing that they were frustrated.
<laughs> so Sandra, we are actually at time. The countdown no has kidding. ended. I, I, I really appreciate your joining us today. Oh, it's a and pleasure. Nice Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much for both for putting on the event and for enabling us to share it with, new, with the new generation of people. Uh, all right, everyone, if you are watching on social media, please come over to YouTube and you can watch the debate. It's going to begin momentarily. Thank you all for being here.